you are a soldier and you are getting ready for a very compartmentalized top secret project pertaining to certain military contractors, you know, Lockheed Martin, Raytheon, you name it. We could give some examples in addition to correspondence with, of course, the, I guess you could say, public apparatus of the American system being that of the military and sort of that whole aspect of defense. And so you go into a deep underground military base and you are then given a badge with two stripes on the corner on the top left corner of that particular badge one is a bit of a lighter shade of blue and then the second one is a little bit of a darker shade of blue and then you are then sent on over to your superior you do not you are not told what position your superior holds except again they're wearing you know military fatigues and it seems like it's just a regular you know top secret operation as you've been in a handful before your superior then says, okay, let's hop on the Magneto Leviton train, right? That travels at at least Mach 2 speeds. And you go to a certain location. You don't even know where it is and you don't ask questions because you know that's the way things work. This is your third or fourth top secret compartmentalized operation, right? What ends up happening is you then are taken by your superior to a door once you get off of the Magneto Leviton train. And in front of that door is an individual in a black suit, the traditional sort of men in black look as we tend to know them to be, whether it's from movies or, you know, personal experiences or what have you. The gentleman or the being, if you will, looks human, but a little, a little something is off. And then that man in black, seemingly a male, says to your superior, is he okay? Is he clear to come in? Your superior says, yep. And then the man in black goes, but is he dead? Your superior goes, he's dead. Don't worry. And then the man in black looks at your superior again. And you're watching all this, by the way. You're like right in the middle of this conversation, except you're just not talking. The man in black goes, no, 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 no. Is he dead? And your superior looks back at the man and says, yes, trust me. Now, today's episode is called Site R, Harvesting Mutilated Cadavers to Unincarnate Hexahedronal Knots, and in brackets, heirloom. There's a lot to cover, but I know it sounds a little bit complicated or complex, but we're going to break all of this down to the extent in which by the end of this episode, you fully understand what's happening. Now, with that being said, I'd like to give a very special shout out to Genius, and like I said, we will be getting very soon to a lot of the fans that, like uh, in the good old days, as I call them, uh, got shouted out. There's quite a bit of you, and I've, uh, for those that are seeing this, this this episode will be released throughout the week, but I recorded a handful within the same day, which is why you might notice these next few episodes. I keep saying, I got to get to you folks. I got to get to you folks. Now, the final thing is that we do have a Patreon, www.patreon.com slash generation Z. It does help support the show. Not only that, but we pump out loads and loads of not just early access content, but members only content. In addition to telegram groups, you know, uh, zoom calls, being able to see what I'm working on in real time, because I, you know, share with the members, my research as I'm going along. We help, we sort of debunk things together. It's a great thing. Anyways, let's jump right into it. So first off, we need to understand what Site R is or was, depending how you view it. Now, according to mimbrez.com, if we take a look here, known as Site R, it is no secret that Raven Rock is a deep underground military base used as the alternative to the National Military Command Center, also known as the Underground Pentagon. It has been speculated that leaders such as Vice President Dick Cheney and others were taken to Raven Rock during the chaos of 9-11 in 2000. And one. The existence of Raven Rock is no secret. The layout and use of this facility suggests how to locate and identify other above ground locations that are also used as entrances to deep underground military bases. The west entrance to Raven Rock is clearly visible from above. And as we could see here, uh, Camden, as always, thank you, brothers, putting up on the screen some of these entrances to Raven Rock. Now, again, it's not so much the entrances to these deep underground military bases so much as it is about the different levels underneath that many do not even know exist, right? So if we scroll down even more, we're going to see here some alleged deep underground military uh, base maps and things like this. Now, many, many years ago, this base, Raven Rock, was considered classified and was used as the meeting grounds for the Majestic 12 and the National Security Council relative to the alien presence on Earth. With that being said, though, obviously things have changed. So if we take a look here at publicintelligence.net, what we're going to find here is, again, an actual satellite image of Raven Rock Mountain Complex, or Site R. And what we're going to find here, okay, is this right over here. And I quote, Many of the facility's activities are classified, and distribution of most unclassified information about this facility is discouraged by the government. Okay? On May 25th, 2007, the Federal Register published a Defense Department policy declaring that it is unlawful for any person entering in or on the property to make any photograph, sketch, picture, drawing, map, or graphical representation of the 
Raven Rock Mountain Complex without first obtaining the necessary permission. Now, again, what we're going to find here is if we scroll down based on the history of it, and you folks will see why I'm bringing this up so strongly very soon, is that in 1976, and I quote, the unit was redesigned, or redesignated, excuse me, as the USAC Site R Telecommunication Center, a direct reporting element to the 7th Signal Command, end quote. Interestingly enough, if we take a look relative to Wikipeak's disclosure of Vault 7, we could say that the assimilations of the naming pertaining to the different apparatuses within the CIA, within obviously uh, Raven Rock, could be coincidental. But notice something, folks. Any time, and this is something that my research has found quite recently as well, any time there is a reference to anything pertaining to telecommunications, it, nowadays we have been so propagandized to simply think about cell phones, smartphones, you name it. Telecommunications has to do with a multi-layered intrinsic esoteric system pertaining to the unincarnation of hexahedronal knots. Now, what do we mean by that? Let's take a look at this right over here. Individualogist.com. Now we see here the different types of sacred geometry. We'll scroll down. 13 sacred geometry symbols. The Flower of Life, the um, Sri Yantra. We have Metatron's Cube. We have that we've covered a bit, the Seed of Life. Notice, by the way, these symbolic patterns are representative of that of what we'll be disclosing later in this episode pertaining to the public academia of scientific revelations. But this is the main thing I wanted to focus on here. The hexahedron. The hexahedron is one of five platonic solids. And I quote, as each platonic shape represents one universal element, the hexahedron represents the earth with its stable foundations. The hexahedron is known to contain consistent energy, which gives light to all living things, especially humans. It is believed to be the meeting point of the spirit and the body. If a person is seeking consistency and stability, this is the symbol to associate with, end quote. Now, if you folks watched the previous members episode, you'll, uh, excuse me, public episode, not just the, the members, but that even delves more into it. But the previous public episode, you'll realize there is a deep connection between the alleged dissertations that have been written pertaining to the manifestation of there being certain subatomic structures that could actually manifest and hold items of consciousness relative to the, to the conflationary direction of that of this physical dimension in, in essence, relative to the other dimensions above or below us. Now, the the reason I bring that up is because if we scroll down even more, we're going to see, you know, the, octa the octahedron, the icosahedron, we have the tetrahedron, but that's not the point. What I want to look at here is number 10, the eternal knot. And I quote, as its name suggests, the eternal knot represents different facets of infinity. It can refer to the endless flow of wisdom in the universe. To some, it is the intertwining of religion and secular affairs. For other religions, the eternal knot is the endless cycle of birth, death, and rebirth. This sacred symbol greatly represents time, growth, and cycle, end quote. I'd like to quickly just paraphrase right over here the intertwining of religious and secular affairs. In that of the public academia of STEM, which has been quite relevant in the last few years, since 2017, really, to sort of be more accepting or at least being more open to these types of conversations, we'll find it's not so much religion and secular affairs as much as it is esotericism, metaphysical proposals, okay, quantum, th purely theoretical quantum physics, time tunneling, all these things that at the time were purely theoretical, and that of the esoteric aspect of the way in which, again, the subatomic structure, uh, pardon me, just dropped my pen, the subatomic structure could actually manifest itself within that of the finite energy. Now, how do we know this? Let's take a look at this right here. Publicdomainreview.org. Okay, Ill uh, illustrations of madness, James Tilly Matthews and the heirloom. In 1810, and I quote John Haslam, a London apothecary, a published, a published the first ever book length description of a mad person's delusions. Until this point, most medical case histories of what we now refer to as mental illness had amounted to a line of or two at most, and more often just a single word such as frenzied or melancholy. But the opinions of James Tilly Matthews resisted any such summary. He described the previously unimagined world of futuristic machines, magnetic spies, and mass brainwashing woven into a bizarre but undeniably well-informed narrative of the high politics behind the Napoleonic Wars, end quote. Now, before I go on, we're going to see here a couple of different points. The reoccurrence and consistency within that of the data points relevant, uh, sorry, relative to the constant reoccurrence of some type of mass psychosis or some type of holographic substrate, miniature project, blue beams, you name it, right, that have been involved with that of human history relative to even just the last thousand years that we know of on record, so to speak, right? Not only this, but also also, at the same time, this is, has a direct correlation to our Patreon members episode that I, at this point, I'm pretty sure had, had come out, per, uh, Med Defcon and uh, Drip, Dash Drip, part number one, pertaining to, I gotta be careful here, but someone with the initials of I and K, okay, having to do with mind control and things like this. Now, I bring this up if... Uh, 
I bring this up because of this, and I quote, Haslam titled his book, Illustrations of Madness, and it was full of lessons for the nascent profession of mad doctoring, later to be known as psychiatry. Again, this has to, this is also relevant to that of the way in which public academia and also the Defense Department and the government, or Majestic 12 if you want to call it, is using former things that sounded crazy to now actually justify the new things that sound crazy, you see? And so, again, things that 10, 20 years ago were thought crazy are now, no, no, it's totally in fact. But now this next thing that people are proposing or things that are leaking, it's all bullshit. Come on, right? Let's carry on. But it was also written to settle a personal score. Haslam was the apothecary at the Royal Bethlehem Hospital. In popular slang, Bedlam, where James Tilly Matthews had for the previous decade been confined as an incurable lunatic. Not everyone, however, believed that Matthews was mad. Haslam's diagnosis had been contested by other doctors, and the governors of Bethlehem had distanced themselves from it. He wrote his book in retaliation against his superiors, but as it turned out, his patient would have the last word. Now, here's what we're going to find. Although Haslam has been relegated to a footnote in the history of psychiatry, his account, again, see, notice how you can make all these contributions, but one simple proposal and you get shut down relative to the social complex and construct of those individuals. It's unfortunate, right? Although Haslam has been relegated to a footnote in the history of psychiatry, his account of Matthews' inner world is still cited as the first fully described case of what we now call paranoid schizophrenia, and in particular, of an influencing machine, the belief or delusion that a covertly operated de device is acting at a distance to control the subject's mind and body. For everyone who has since had messages beamed at them by the CIA, MI5, Masonic lodges, or UFOs, via dental fillings, mysterious implants, TV sets, or surveillance satellites, James Tilly Matthews is patient zero. Now, here's what's interesting as well, too. What we're going to take a look here, again, and this is according to MikeJ.net. I skipped here just because it seems to be a little more of a visualization, uh, visualized representation, but let's take a look here. And I quote, all this represents a striking transition from a century ago when the influencing machine was just beginning to be glimpsed with psychiatric practice as a strange denizen from the far shores of insanity, recorded among the hallucinations of celebrated subjects such as Daniel Paul Schreber and August Strindberg, and yet to attract the attention of its first clinical interpreter, the gifted and tragic Victor Tausk. It is a challenge to the imagination, then, to comprehend how just how uncanny it must have seemed a century, er a century earlier still when, in 1810, the prototype for all these spectral-cum-mechanical uh, devices James Tilly Matthews' heirloom was first presented to the public. Nor was the heirloom a distant ancestor, a rough sketch or fleeting glimpse that would need to be filled in with hindsight by succeeding generations. What we're going to find here ultimately though, however, is again, and I quote, the machine they had developed for this purpose, the heirloom, combined recent developments in gas chemistry with the strange force of animal magnetism or mesmerism. All right? It incorporated keys, levers, barrels, batteries, sails, brass retorts, and magnetic fluid and worked by directing and modulating magnetically charged airs and gases rather as the stops of an organ modulated its tones. It ran on a mixture of foul substances including spermatic animal seminal rays, effluvia, uh, effluvia of dogs, and putrid human breath. And the discharges of fluid extracted from these brain, uh, these substances were focused to deliver thoughts, feeling, and sensations directly into Matthews' brain. End quote. All right. Now... Did you folks notice all those key words there? Magnetism. Not only that, take a look at this here too. Using spermatic animal seminal rays. Interesting, isn't it? Doesn't that remind us of the mutilated cows and animals, if you want to call it, that recently have only come to light relative to the amount that there have been? Don't get me wrong, cattle mutilations and all that have been around for a while, as well as human ones. Again, re from UFOs with lasers so done so precisely in on the bodies, with all the blood removed, the rectum removed, the anus removed, the rectal tract, like the whole thing done in such a meticulous way no human could do it, at least on the public public surface of what the technology we have now relative to the operations that are done. However, what's interesting is that what we find is that this heirloom machine, again, I'm, I'm not saying this is the only way to do it, but this heirloom machine seemed to need certain elements, not just from animals, but from humans in order to operate. This is a very basic machine that was assembled, allegedly. What happens if we take, you know, uh, the projection of the way in which we measure time to be 100,000 years from now and certain aliens are that far ahead of us? They're doing the same thing because ultimately, no matter how advanced their mechanism gets, they still need these cattle. They still need, unfortunately, these human cadavers in order to abduct them and do this. Now, why do I say that? Let's take a look at this right here. Unknownboundaries.com. Waves of UFOs with armies of white uniformed humanoids witnessed during civil war. Interest, uh, posted on October 3rd. 
just this year and this month, this week. How interesting. The images used in the post are artist concepts of witness testimony. Now, what we're going to find here is that, in, I, and I quote, I recently came across upon a newspaper, excuse me, report from 1863 that described the bizarre sighting of UFO armadas accompanied by armies of humanoids in white uniforms witnessed by many in the South during the U.S. Civil War. Now, let's take a look at this. Just over and through the tops of the trees on the adjacent hills to the South, immense numbers of rolls resembling cotton or smoke apparently Apparently the size and shape of doors seem to be passing rapidly through the air, yet in beautiful order and regularity, Mr. Dwyer said. Now, here's what's interesting as well too. If we take a look, and again, the Mr. Dwyer was present during 1863 to describe this. What we're going to find here, and I quote, is that in the deep valley beneath, a thousand upon thousand of what appeared to be human men came in view, traveling in the same direction as the UFOs marching in good order, some 30 or 40 in depth, ascending the almost insurmountable hills opposite, and had the stoop uh, peculiar to men ascending a steep mountain, and quote, eyewitnesses attested. Could it be possible that the way that these craft held, housed these beings, or men, or again, we could have, we could say these are, you know, the breakaway civilization of humans. It's very hard to say, but could we argue very strongly that, in fact, these crafts were using pocket dimensions, which is why thousands of, of, of individuals or, or beings, bipedal beings, could come out of these craft, where there were only, you know, 30 or 40 of them, if you will. Again, we have to understand the size of the craft, too, but relative to the scale in which the visualization was depicted, we can propose this as well very strongly, right? Let's carry on. There seemed to be a great, and I quote, a great variety in the size of the men. Some were very large, whilst others were quite small. Their arms, legs, and heads could be distinctly seen in motion. They seemed to observe strict military discipline, and there were no stranglers. There was uniformity of dress, white blouses or shirts, with white pants. They were without guns, swords, or anything that indicated men of war. On they, they came through the valley and over the steep road and finally passing out of sight in a direction due north from those who were looking on, said the editor who had witnessed the event, end quote. Interestingly enough, what we're going to find here is that, again, if we take a look at this website, darkoutpost.com, we'll see here, and I quote, spiritual channeler Ivan Teller channels men, men in black, again, like the example I gave at the beginning, who confirmed that somewhere in Dolce, New Mexico underground base, there's an extensive cloning facility, including a room full of, okay, this part is a little bit interesting, you know, Joe Biden clones with, uh, you know, certain things and, uh, what have you, end quote. Again, it's very possible the elites, not specifically Joe Biden, but again, he is president, so it is relative to the modern day uh, affairs in, in surface level politics, but I could see this happening. With that being said, not so much, again, specifically Joe Biden, but the cloning aspect of it. Again, it's possible Biden's a clone, but that's not the point here. They were going in the direction of what is now known to be. These, these white uh, uniformed individuals were going in the direction of what is now known to be Site R. Not only that, but relative to the example that I gave at the very beginning of this episode, pertaining to the whole thing of that man in black asking, is he dead or not? The reason for that is because when humans get mutilated and also when cattle get mutilated, what ends up happening or is that their skin depending on the mutilation operation is at certain energetic apparatuses about on top of the skin are extracted and used to help build some of their craft. Now, how do we know this? I cannot say officially, but uh, I, I have to say that off the record, we could say very strongly and propose that some of the outer layers of this craft, of certain beings craft, not all of them, right? Because some look more uh, aluminum and metallic, if you will. And again, not saying that it is metallic, but some of the craft, such as that of the Tic Tac, if you will, similar to what has been described in this Civil War depiction, their outer layer is what is comprised of that of human and uh, a cow cattle mutilation allegedly in order to continue the electromagnetic spectrum of them being void of space and time relative to the planet that they're on again which is earth and we know that because unincarnate is essentially a form of saying undead zombies whatever you want to call it right and how do we know this well let's take a look right over here if we take a look again at darkoutpost.com, look at some of the maps of the alleged deep underground military bases. More accurate depicted ones, black and white, I will say, but very good. The locations match those in which these soldiers were seen going in that of the Civil War, including Mr. James Tilly Matthews, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, J yes, James Tilly Matthews, same general location. Not only that, but it's corresponding with that of ley lines. There is a massive energetic incorporation here that a lot of people seem to be missing out on. Now, the next thing I'd like to take a look at specifically is this right over here. This is defensetech.org, okay? And we're going to find here uh, deep underground military bases and photographs that were taken, all right, pertaining to that of certain Antarctica bases and things like this. Now, the reason I bring this up is not to just sort of dilly-dally on this website. This is here is in Greenland. 
Greenland, some Antarctica. But the point is, if they were building this back then, why would they stop building it now? And I say that because if we take a look here at ufocasebook.com, New Mexico, if we see here, and I quote, one afternoon, I caught sight of something out of the corner of my eye. The oddest thing about these craft is that they made no noise at all that I could hear. I snapped five pictures that afternoon of these craft, but this is the only one with two flying close to each other. I don't believe in flying saucers from other planets at all. Interestingly enough, I live in New Mexico under an Air Force flight path. Stealth fighters are not at all unusual in the skies over my house. Occasionally, I see aircraft that I cannot identify and have gotten in the habit of keeping a camera handy when I'm going to be outside for a while, end quote. Now, as of the time this episode is airing, there's a previous public episode having to do with a gentleman by the name of Bottled Water, the ex-US Army Staff Sergeant. You'll notice as well that he can corroborate some of these sightings pertaining to, again, what he can speak on. I don't want to speak on behalf of him, but, you know, craft coming and going, seemingly leaving the general vicinity of that of alleged underground military base locations where UFO craft are coming and going not saying that that is what he says but again interestingly enough we'll find the consistency is there relative to what he can speak about now the next thing i want to point out are actually a handful of documents let's take a look at this right here report of the second annual meeting of the working group on extraterrestrial resources now we can find here in this document no specific reference to extraterrestrials a lot of people say oh you know dave this doesn't mean there's aliens this is a whole a package having to do with again wanting to establish bases on the moon and mars you name it but we now know to be the case that there are actually substantiated, uh, I guess you could say, uh, credible individuals that have substantiated this and provided this. However, let's take a look at this right here. Space operations through the looking glass. Now, this was a document that was made public. And again, it does officially, they say, does not represent the perspectives of the DOD, the US government, NASA, blah, blah, blah. Anyways, the point is this. This is a multi-page document, right? But let's take a look here. The balance of influence in the information technologies has shifted from the Department of Defense to commercial organizations. This trend will continue and accelerate between now and 2025. The crucial importance of detailed, timely knowledge and rapid ultra-wideband communications to military space operations will demand the extensive use of commercial, possibly international space systems and technologies. The world of 2025 will see a crowded sky filled with space systems shared by military and government organizations on the one hand and commercial concerns on the other end quote notice this sentence right here folks the balance of influence of in the information technologies has shifted from the department of defense to commercial organizations now the the uh, the references will be in the description for those on youtube this is page number nine page number nine of 97 for those that are interested in seeing this now let's jump to this document right over here project beta alien war plans no word of a lie folks two years the sorry the following and i quote are key mile posts established or discovered during the continuing scientific study concerning alien intervention and the result study limited solely to new mexico two years con uh, continuous record electronic surveillance and tracking 24 hours a day of data of alien ships with a 60 mile radius of albuquerque plus 6,000 feet motion picture of same day uh, daylight and night now take a look at some of this too through the alien communication loop, the true underground base location was divulged by the alien and precisely pinpointed. We're going to find here again, too. We'll notice, again, prior alien communication had indicated military uh, involvement and the fact the U.S. had the Air Force had a ship, uh, but due to studied alien technology, a uh, psychology, this was ignored at the time. Uh, we'll find here as well. Subsequently, the alien communicated uh, following verification with the CIR that there was indeed a ship, actually more than one, that two were wrecked and left behind and another built. The ship is atomic powered and flying the alien indicated its basing location okay now what we're going to find here as well too is that we'll notice that the extraterrestrial is messing with their minds brain transplants things like that now this is a 16 page document again it will be in the description for those that are interested but we'll also notice too that there is certain i guess you could say elements of this that are that are very frightening and again i i don't want to fear monger because I, I i'm all for peaceful interrelations with the extraterrestrials but if we take a look at this right here and i quote also note that all of the aliens human humanoid alike almost have implants without them no direct communication is apparently possible so one can most generally arbitrarily say that if a person states that he or she communicated by thought with an alien he or she most likely has been implanted they may also claim to be overly psychic and be able to prove this again through the link transplant he or she is given the information by the alien and does not realize end quote now if we notice here they are not to be trusted it is suspected if one was considered a friend and if one were to call upon that friend in the time of dire physical threat the friend would qu quickly side with the other side all right end quote now we notice here sorry one more thing the computer indicates in comparison that no known Earth protagonist, at least of this species, is involved in making kind of agreement with these aliens, at least of this species. 
Okay, now, end quote, the reason I bring that up is because if we take a look at the computer, it says the computer indicated, what we're noticing here is that when they reference the computer, they're actually talking about something that was a dissemination and an early version of the Promise software, P-R-O-M-I-S, that Robert Maxwell helped sell on behalf of the Mossad. Now, you might be saying, Dave, why do you bring this up? Well, to wrap this up, let's take a look at techexplore.com. Brain cell differences could be key to learning in humans and AI. Ah, you don't say. Researchers have found that variability between between brain cells might speed up learning and improve the performance of the brain and future AI. The new study found that by tweaking the electrical properties of individual cells and in simulations of brain networks, the networks learned faster than simulations with identical cells. They also found that the, that the networks needed fewer of the tweaked cells to get the same results and that the method is less energy intensive than models with identical cells." End quote. Now, take a look at this right here, sciencex.com. Researchers discovered the world's first monolayer silicon carbide towards atomic level semiconductor technology. Technologies. Again, notice for those that watched our roundtable with Chaz, Bruce Fenton, Lester Velez, Andrew Deepshare, you name it, a Brandon from Expanding Reality podcast. Look at this. Again, the hexagon, the sort of beehive composition of that. Now, I know a lot of you may not be fans of it, and a lot of you may in fact be. But the whole point, going back to the hexahedronal knots, is that using the technology that has been slightly identified within that of the description of heirloom, relative to the military structure that seems to be si that occurred in this during the Civil War, that seems to be similar to the structure here, in which we see from ScienceX.com. It is being used for implants to be placed, not maybe for bad reasons, but also maybe not for good reasons, around the world to create a hive mind consciousness that is not so much a hive mind on the surface level, but is esoterically distorted. Therefore, you then have something called unincarnation. You are then feeding yourself to the artificial, I guess you could say, hexahedron which again has many infusions of different energy apparatuses all around the world. And the final thing is that if we take a look at SciTechDaily.com, world's smallest brain-inspired computer, so small that it can harvest its energy itself, folks. It can harvest its energy itself. The energy consumption of the device will be so small that it can harvest energy itself directly from its surroundings. The project has received front funding from the Willem Experiment Program, end quote. Now, members, unfortunately, I can't talk about this publicly, but we will be delving into the Willem Experiment Program very, very soon. With that being said, folks, what we're going to find here, again, is that... There are 12 orders the magnitude better than modern supercomputer technologies. Notice 3, 6, 9, 12. Those numbers keep reoccurring. Again, going back to earlier in this episode, the correlation of Vault 7, number 7 earlier on. Not only that, but these certain species of extraterrestrials like to renew the contract with humans, or at least with Americans, every nine years. Interestingly enough, and that can be corroborated by the alleged substantial propositions pertaining to the 2002 Crabwood uh, UFO uh, message or binary message incident. With that being said, folks, I know there's a lot to take in here, but I think it's very important that I took the time to break this down, and I hope you uh, you all watch to the end, and we'll catch you very, very soon. Cheers.